step one to really, really getting clear on your intuition is first to just feel safe sitting in an emotion and not taking action or not making a decision based off that emotion, right? So just allowing an uncomfortable emotion to sit in your body and not make that mean anything of, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to take action. You've gotten great at divine working, but what about divine living? Welcome to the Divine Living Podcast. I'm your host, Gina DeVee. You're not alone in wanting more. And here at the Divine Living Podcast, you can expect to be part of conversations from women like us who unapologetically dream big and are obsessed with manifesting our most fabulous lives. The conversation starts now. Scout Sobel, welcome to the Divine Living Podcast. It's such a joy and honor to be interviewing you today. You have been such an extraordinary help uh, to me in getting my podcast out in the world. And I, it's such a, such a pleasure to be able to feature you to my community. We're going to talk about your book, talk about really important subjects uh, that I know all you members of the Divine Living community are going to love. So Scout, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This is such an honor. And I know that we're going to get into a really, really good conversation. So I'm excited. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, we're going to get right to it because I know as having a background and a master's degree in clinical psychology and was a psychotherapist for years, how many people silently suffer. And particularly when it comes to mental health issues and emotional issues and family dynamics and kind of like all the invisible stuff that really ends up running our lives. And I don't know if I've ever come across someone in our woman entrepreneurial community who has so generously shared her own story. So uh, for my audience who might be a little bit new to you, why don't you start with... um, sharing some of the emotional pieces of your journey that have led you to be the entrepreneurial powerhouse that you are today. Yeah. So it really, you know, it all goes back to early, early childhood, but I like to kind of say that my story really started developing when I was 14, a freshman in high school, I had my first depressive episode and all of a sudden I went down pretty quickly. I start, you know, I stopped taking care of myself, isolating in my room, self-harming, et cetera. And uh, when my school found out, my parents immediately put me into therapy and I went to therapy maybe, you know, once a week or twice a month throughout all of high school. And I think there was a little bit of a confusion. Is it teenage hormones or is something bigger happening here? But, you know, looking back, I was the only person, you know, in my friend group, I went to a pretty small school that was in therapy. It was pretty well known that I was having some emotional issues, if you want to call it that. And I took a 500 question test, I remember, and I really didn't want to take it. But, you know, I filled in how, you know, one to five, fill in the bubbles and the results really came back and said that I was flirting between chronic and clinical depression. But it wasn't really until I left for college. My parents had just gotten divorced. I moved out of the house into a new city. And that's really when my brain started exhibiting some dangerous behavior. I started uh, getting very paranoid. I started thinking that men were in my closet, underneath my bed, on my balcony, coming to harm and kill me. I thought they were following me home in my trunk, you name it. And so once I started losing touch with reality, I remember calling my dad on my balcony of my apartment because I didn't want my roommates to hear crying. And my dad, again, was trying to figure out, you know, is this my daughter not being able to handle the divorce and moving out for the first time or is something bigger happening here? And it became quite clear uh, quite quickly once I started going to psychiatrists' offices and started getting a little bit deeper into therapy, that there was something bigger happening to me. And uh, that I was formally diagnosed with bipolar disorder type two when I was 20 years old. And I, you know, it's crazy to think that that was 10 years ago. And, you know, just 10 years ago, there was not Instagram, there wasn't mental health awareness month, there really wasn't a lot of resources available. And so When I received the diagnosis, I thought it was a death sentence. I chalked myself up to being crazy. I was in New York going to Sarah Lawrence at the time, and I got on the first flight home back to San Diego, and I dropped out of college. 
went through an outpatient program. I was locked up on a 5150 and things definitely got worse before they got better. I tried to hold a minimum wage job. I tried to be a gelato scooper, a hostess. I tried to enroll in night classes. I tried to intern at fancy magazines and I just had this complete inability to function in society. And so, you know, conversations around what I was going to end up as were, were, ha- were being had between my parents and my doctors, et cetera. And it really wasn't until my husband came into my life. We started dating right when I turned 21 and he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't care if you're depressed, if you're depressed and hopeful, I can be in this relationship, but if you're depressed and hopeless, I can't be here. Fierce. Yeah. I'm sorry. Fierce. Yeah. You know, he is 10 years sober. So he comes from the recovery world. At that point, he was Mm -hmm. a year and a half sober. And that's really when my life changed. The suffering didn't go down, but the perspective and the resilience and the, the spirit to fight for my life started being cultivated. And after a year of support groups and expressing gratitude and all of the things that I tried to find from the self-help aisle in Barnes and Noble, which was a very weird aisle to walk down 10 years ago, um, I found entrepreneurship. And the minute I did, my mind just, it just ran with it. It felt comfortable. And that's kind of when I started the whole journey. Cool, cool, cool. We're going to get into that. And I just want to just celebrate you. I mean, from going from depression and isolation and psychotic episodes and, and hospitals to finding your way. And we're going to talk about all the brilliant ways that you have, you know, it's, um, for somebody, you know, and and you don't have to necessarily be diagnosed with bipolar disorder to, to be afraid of your emotions. You know, I mean, people without a specific diagnosis can have a panic attack. Women going through menopause or pregnancy can have like major hormonal swings where like you can't stop crying or you can't not feel depressed or, you know, some of these really intense emotions. So for anyone listening that feels like their emotions have overtaken them and are in charge of their life versus the opposite, what advice or ray of hope do you, can you offer them, Scout? You know, for me to, to get through those, those moments and to feel more empowered through them, it's really to cultivate the belief that you are safe in your emotions. Mm -hmm. When you believe that you are safe in your emotions, you do not resist them. I believe that a lot of the suffering that comes from those really, really deep, dark moments of despair is us not accepting that we feel that way and therefore we fight it. We add you know, fuel to the fire, et cetera. But when you really feel safe in your emotions, you don't have to like it. Believe me, I don't. But <laughs> you accept it and, and you can allow your emotions to come in. You can develop a new relationship with them where you ask them, hey, depression, anxiety, sadness, fear, it sounds like you really have something to say to me right now. So I'm going to give you the floor because I trust you because I trust that you're trying to tell me something really important right now. They're kind of bearing a message, bearing a message. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really about believing that you're safe and then honoring your emotions versus trying to get rid of them. I think that allows them to move through you in an intense way, but they move through a lot quicker when you do that. Mm Mm-hmm. So let's talk about, um, and we're going to get into more of an entrepreneurial conversation. I, knowing the emotional gamut, and I believe full heartedly, like the big answer is not to get rid of the depression or the anxiety or the boredom um, or even the fear too quickly. Because my first therapist said to me, Gina, before you turn away from a problem, make sure you don't want the gift that it's holding for you. And so very similarly, I would start to take a look at like, okay, what is, what gift is the depression holding? What gift is the anxiety holding? And that to me is a very conscious, very emotionally sober way to navigate the emotional terrain 
And then as Esther Hicks talks about getting into the next best feeling emotion, you know, when, when you're like really present with yourself. And then there is, how do I want to say it? I'm going to use, well, I'm going to use an archetype for my book because I don't mean for this to be judgmental, but then there's the princess mentality that is high strung in emotions. And I'll see like women in the entrepreneurial space do this. So like, for example, like they'll sign up for a program and then three months in, they're like, you know, I'm just not feeling it anymore. You know, intuitively I'm feeling like I'm meant to go elsewhere. So I'd like a refund or I went out of my contract. What do you have to say to that? Like what, cause I don't want people to misinterpret, like feel safe in your emotions. Well, I feel safe getting out of this contract. What do you have to say to that scout? Oh my God, that's a question of integrity, right? Mm -hmm. That's also a question of um, when you sign up for things, are you taking ownership for your, your progress in that container? Because mm -hmm. I think that when you sign up for courses and classes and masterminds and all of these things, right? It's sometimes we walk into them without accountability or responsibility for our own transformation. And therefore we just, throw it onto the person who's holding us in this container. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a really deep dive of, am I being accountable to my progress? Am I taking ownership over my progress? Does my word mean something? Am I attached to the commitments I make and do I show up within them, right? Because without integrity and without taking full responsibility over your emotions and your healing and your expansion, there will always be something you can point at, a refund you want, a person to blame, et cetera. It's the minute, et cetera. Sorry, it's the minute you show up with radical responsibility over of your life is when the true transformation happens. Love it. So what would you say then is the difference? Because someone in that moment, they really feel like they're trusting their emotions. They feel like they're honoring themselves. And so what's the difference in your opinion when you say to like really feel safe in your emotions, like how, like if someone's like, well, how do I know what's true or kind of what's impulsive? Like what's a true emotion and what's like the impulsive emotion that feels very emotional at that moment? That is a muscle that requires so much experience. And I think step one to really, really getting clear on your intuition is First, to just feel safe sitting in an emotion and not taking action or not making a decision based off that emotion, right? So just allowing an uncomfortable emotion to sit in your body and not make that mean anything of, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to take action, right? So first, just surrendering into the emotion. Once you do that, you can get, and it passes because making decisions within a heightened emotion, you are safe, but it's not the most rational place to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I really believe, you know, Shaman Durek in his book has this great exercise, which I love, and it's called the yes, I don't know what he calls it, but I call it the yes or no exercise, where when you are feeling emotionally kind of neutral, feel what a yes feels like in your body, and then feel what a no feels like in your body. And that's a way to determine the difference between subtle senses that you might have like for example oh that's good isn't that yeah. good yes. Because, yes. yeah because sometimes we can feel anxiety or we think it's anxiety but it's actually nervousness or exhilaration etc so for me I've gotten so good at just sitting and not attempting to judge label make an action etc within the heavy emotions and then then I like to from a calmer space make more of a rational plan forward. I like to employ a lot of empathy and see the other person's perspective, see kind of all angles there. But I, within just allowing myself to surrender and sit and then trying on what feels like a yes and what feels like a no when I'm in a neutral space, I start to dwindle down what my emotions are telling me. Is this anxiety because I'm going out of my comfort zone or is this anxiety because I don't want to sign this client and I know they're going to be a headache before I've even signed them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that over time you, you build that muscle like anything else, but I think it starts with just practicing sitting in your emotion first and allowing it to pass before or not feeling the need to judge label and create an action plan within that emotional experience. 
Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. The the words of someone who has done her work <laughs> on the subject that very, very clear for sure. Um, so, and if for anyone listening to this conversation, Scout has written an incredible book called The Emotional Entrepreneur. And I think this might be a great time to segue into how it's, it seems like you used entrepreneurialism. I mean, I know you've done many modes of healing, but it seems like entrepreneurialism has been one of the most encompassing forms of healing for you. Yes. Yeah, it really has. And it's, it's kind of interesting to associate it as a healing modality, but it really, really has given me my purpose. So say more. So you're like, being diagnosed, you know, labeled all this stuff, you know, can't hold down a job. And you're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. So it, it's almost as if the idea chose me and I didn't choose it. I was sitting um, at a coffee shop with a friend of mine. And at that point, because of the year I had kind of had taking a little bit more radical responsibility over my emotional landscape, I got to a point where I could hold a very part-time job as a barista and I think at that point I was about to enroll in one or two community college classes. And I was sitting with my friend and we were reading a magazine, an indie magazine, and I've always had a love affair with magazines. And I looked at her and I just said, do you want to start a magazine? And she said, yes. And we decided that we were just going to print it at Kinko's and, you know, we were going to take all the photos with disposable cameras and it was going to be a free arts and crafts project for our friends. And I went home and something in my brain switched. I mean, you call it mania, I don't know. I was sitting there and researching and all of a sudden I had, you know, appointments at the top printers in the, in the county. And then I got a quote for $10,000 because obviously I wanted the nicest paper. And then I did a Kickstarter campaign and, you know, fast forward, Barnes and Noble contacted me and picked up our third issue in all of their stores, as well as every newsstand across the country. And we had musician Halsey on the cover. And I went from the girl who could barely be a barista and a minimum wage job to running this magazine and going to school full time and working part time as a barista at the same time. And I became the girl who could over function because, you know, I, I could very easily have my psychiatrist write me a note to get out of my shift, right? To get out of my waitressing or hostessing shift. It was very easy. I was, I had a mental illness at the, at the drop of a hat, people would excuse me from my responsibilities. But when you're an entrepreneur, if you don't show up, there's no one to tap out. There's no one to tap mm -hmm. in, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like the over responsibility. I needed more responsibility to show up. It was like this pressure point. Mm-hmm. So that's how I started. Amazing, amazing. You know, um, your book has so many beautiful lessons in it. And one of the ones that I see women struggle the most with happens to be lesson 19 ladies in her book. Um, so we'll give the link so make sure you're gonna get her book. Um, responsibility is scary and you were born for it. I see so many like smart, creative, capable, soulful, interesting women like get excited about an idea like you did about the magazine and then are like, wait a minute. Oh my God, what am I doing? Can I do it? Like, and, and just like cripple over the perceived responsibility. Will you share with them more about your teachings on responsibility? Oh God, responsibility gets me every time because every time you up level and expand, it's a bigger le level of responsibility that you don't know if you can handle. And I always come back to the anecdotes of when I first hired my first employee at Scouts Agency, which is the agency I run today. I literally almost vomited for 48 hours. I just was. I love that. And it wasn't just her first employee. It was her best friend. <laughs> Everyone knows that like, that's the worst combination. Scout's like, yep, I'm going to take this on. And it happens to be my best friend. So keep going. Oh yeah. I was like, this sounds fun. Um, it was a total, you know, I don't think very much when I make decisions, which is a total blessing and a total curse at the same time. I think more of a blessing because it gets me into the game faster, but I literally wanted, I had a headache. I was shaking. I wanted to throw up. And then, you know, the second employee I hired, it went from 48 hours of nausea to 24 hours. And then the third, it was like, 
I felt nausea one morning and I was like, oh, I'm about to hire someone. And then I just did it. And so today I hire very easily and quickly and I feel quite comfortable with it. And so I think that when you are faced with more responsibility, look back into your past for evidence of what once felt scary to take on that now feels like second nature, because that's going to happen every time you up level, you'll feel the fear, you'll move through it, and then it'll become second nature and you, you, it'll feel like a natural extension, right? Now I have four full-time employees planning for my fifth and it feels very easy now for me, but in the beginning it was very difficult. And so if you can find evidence in your past of things that you were afraid of taking on and then you took it on and it was totally fine and great and you handled it, I think that helps you through the through the motions. But you know, I, I'm very honest about the fact that every up level, every addition of responsibility, it's it's stretching a new muscle and it's gonna feel scary. But if you can move through that fear, your business specifically opens up in ways that you really never imagined were possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I'll say one more thing. I, I, I don't know if I want to normalize this, or I just want to be really honest about the fact that sometimes when you're running a business, you have moments where you don't want any of it, right? I woke up one day, I was like, I don't want this payroll situation. I don't want clients. I don't want this. I don't want that. I want to run to a, the Bahamas on a deserted island and never see any of this again. And you also don't have to make that into anything when that moment comes, because that moment does come. I journaled it out and I wasn't afraid to say out loud, I don't want this right now because I knew that that was going to pass. That's mm -hmm. responsibility and fear kind of coming up into your energy field. And you've got to release it thinking or feeling shame. Like, Oh my God, am I not living my purpose? If this is coming up and is this not for me? Da 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 just adds the self-doubt. And so just know that those moments come up when responsibility feels too big and just say it for what it is and let it out because it passes and you go right back to being exactly aligned with what you're doing. Yeah, and P.S., any woman that's like so lit up about everything about the entrepreneurial path and doesn't have an exit plan to an island. I mean, mine is waiting tables in Cyprus. Like you need to rethink things, sister. Like we need to remember that there are other ways of doing life. And if we do return to our business is fine, but I, I am a big believer in a island exit plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, me too. My mom's is working at Starbucks. I'm like, mom, can you get a better one? You know, can you get a better ice cream? Well, one year, one year, it was, it was so tough for me. I was meaning like I was so done. I was like at multiple seven figures and I was just like, I remember I walked into Williams Sonoma in, during the holidays and I saw those people like men and women in aprons. And I was like this. <laughs> this is, is my dream is to hand someone a Le Creuset Dutch oven and gift wrap it and stand behind a register and bring it up like it's, yeah. you get to those moments um well I think that segues into my next uh piece that I love from your book it's lesson 11 lack mindset is a waste of time oh gosh um, so I want to say this and then I'm going to have you like go into it. Like, you know, I think the thing, I think this relates to responsibility also. We think that more responsibility is what's going to cripple us and not necessarily true. Like I've been more of a hot mess when I've had less responsibility than more. And same thing with the lack of, like, we think that thinking bigger is all this like heavy responsibility and, and the big risk and this and that. And I found like the lack mindset is actually the bigger risk. I, you know, and I say this with love because this person might be listening. Someone DM me recently and she shared that she herself was a corporate executive and that she had loved my work and she had been following me and, um, and had been listening to my podcast and, and had gotten a bunch of my free stuff. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. I said, well, if you, um, if you're enjoying the podcast, you, you do you have my book, you might because it's a similar message in there. And she was so proud to tell me corporate executive woman living in the Western world said, I don't have your book yet, but let me tell you, she was so excited. To, like I put it on my wish list in my Amazon cart for my husband to buy for me for Christmas. Oh, wow. And I was like, 
and the world will be saved by the Western woman. Like what is going on that we think that we've got to put up, look at, there are people that I understand that that is a wish list. Like the people do not have all of the privileges that most people listening to this do, but if you're a corporate executive in the Western world and that's the mindset, so talk to us about this lack mindset as a waste of time, Scout. Oh, you don't want to know what's on my wish list for my husband to give me one day. <laughs> you and I should compare notes and then our husband should freak out together. Yeah, exactly. You know, sometimes I'm like, I'm just going to buy it myself, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's this really, really tricky cage that keeps us not only from earning more, but it keeps us from enjoying our lives to the fullest. Mm -hmm. It keeps us from understanding what is truly possible for, for us. When we live in this lack mindset, we, we live in scarcity. We live you know, in a cage, essentially. There's no room for growth or improvement. I love listening to women who are so further beyond than I am down the path. And I love hearing things like, you know, one girl had $180,000 a month. Boom. Wow. That is now possible for me just because that exists in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you walk around with a lack mindset, you actually block off the energy channels that allow expansion and abundance, whether it's money or feeling joy or love relationships, et cetera, to come into your life. I, you know, this can be directly in sales. It can be directly in, in the way you approach and, and feel about your life in general. But whenever you approach something with a lack mindset, you immediately signal to the universe, God, spirit, creator, whatever you want to call it, that you are only available for this increment. Mm -hmm. And you don't allow the millions of other increments that you actually can call into your life. So in a manifestation kind of context, you're actually asking for less than you can receive. Than you desire to receive. Than you desire, than you deserve, that you can. And I, I know that this kind of blows people's minds sometimes of, of what they can receive because they're so limited into, into scarcity or they don't, they don't give themselves the permission to dream even bigger, right? Mm -hmm. to kind of move through the glass ceiling and, and just go crazy. Like just spend a day with your imagination going absolutely insane, right? Like I want a castle in the South of France and one in Tuscany, you know, just mm -hmm. exercising that huge, crazy dreaming allows you to look around in your daily life and see more possibility. Lack mindset will also cripple you in your business. You know, Gina, when you came on OKSIS podcast a couple months ago, I was in a lack mindset that week. And I knew that I was being tested to break through what I thought was possible for my business. And I allowed myself to have the fit. I allowed myself to feel scared. I allowed myself to live in that scarcity for a second. And then I surrendered it because... No, none, nothing about a lack energy brings anything back into your life. And the minute I surrender it, obviously I've done this a million times, the minute I surrendered it and saw the abundance in my life and was grateful for the beautiful magic I have is when I basically doubled my revenue for October. So yes, queen. Yes. I remember we were talking after and I, you know, just soared. And so that soaring and expansion is only possible once you remove a scarcity or lack of mindset from your vocabulary, your heart, and your energy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which leads so perfectly into a concept that you write in the back of your book, uh, not the back of the book, but towards the end of the book, love yourself, then love yourself some more. And I think so many people were like brought up to be, think like, well, don't brag and don't focus on yourself. And then we've warped it to turn it into this thing where it's like, oh no, but who am I? So let's, let's give a final shout out to love yourself and love yourself some more. What do you have to say about that? Oh my God. It is such a trip self-love because I think that we're marketed it and all day long. And then when we get to it, which I've gotten to it, we think, oh no, can't be arrogant. Can't really express it publicly too much. And so it's this really strange paradox that's put upon us, but I think 
I was with a couple of my girlfriends and we were talking and they asked me, there's like, I don't know if it's a TikTok trend. I don't know. I'm terrible at this stuff, but there's this conversation happening on social about main character. But we're only talking about (laughs) (laughs) self-love. Exactly. About main character energy. And my friend said that they never had that and they had to learn that. And it's something that I've always, I feel like had. And if you, if you don't have that and, and you are asking, well, why, why should that be me, et cetera? I write in my book and I've really got to get better at articulating this because I think it's a little bit confusing the way I put it, but let me know, Gina, if this translates here. Mm-hmm. We all have a very unique perspective and we all have talents and gifts that we can offer this world, right? Yes. If you don't believe that about yourself, you actually think that you're special. Yes. That you, for some reason, have escaped the inherent codes that come with being a human being and that you are the outlier of all of us. Mm-hmm. And so I invite you to think that you're actually not that special and you actually are just like all of us who have gifts and a perspective and potential and talent and good work ethic and something to bring to the table. Mm-hmm. So if you're thinking that you don't, you're not special, you're human. And in that humanness comes a lot of magic. We were built and created and birthed with magic to come to the table with. Mm -hmm. And thinking anything otherwise is thinking that you're some crazy coincidental outlier, which is just not the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember I, when I was in my late twenties and I went to my spiritual teacher and like, I was like freaking out. I was like really thinking that there was nothing special, nothing different about me. I knew I wanted to be a public speaker, but I thought it had all already been said. Like, what would I possibly say or speak about that hadn't been discussed? And I remember she looked at me and she said, what makes you think you're so special? Mm-hmm. Every, everyone else on the planet has a purpose, but you, you know, it was like, go, go live your path. Like go be who you came here to be. And you know, I have a lot of empathy for my younger self because I know where it came from. I know that there was so much for me that grew up in the church that was just supposed to like be this blind sheep that followed the shepherd and the pastor. And like, you know, so anybody listening that's got that kind of conditioning within you where you were like literally trained to think that you weren't worthy, um, you're listening to this message now for a reason. And it is because everyone has their purpose and be so unapologetic about yours and just be with all of the superstars who have gotten it. Like nobody's better than anyone else. It's just, you have your one spot of the garden. So take really good care of it. Yeah, Gina, I have a question because I grew up in the Jewish religion and I was always told and, you know, growing up in the Jewish religion and culture, it was much more cultural than religious for me, but in the, the kind of text prayers, et cetera, it was always that I was created in God's image. Mm -hmm. And so there was always something very magical about that. I think unconsciously that I, that I absorbed as a young child. Yes. So um, we're, we're talking about the same <laughs> uh, spiritual scripture here. There's a difference, and I'm being very generalized. So yeah, yeah, yeah. in the Jewish culture and, be- and religion and people from the Christian one, this is my perspective on it because I was raised Christian, but also raised amongst Jews. So I'm an honorary member of the tribe. And the Christians will say they were created in God's image and they know that they are safe and loved as God is their father. However, depending on the, tr- so that is the text that mm-hmm. in, in, in its pureness, that is what the message is meant to be that we are all created in God's image, that, that, that we are all an extension of source, but depending on the church that you, uh, for, for me, depending on the church that you went to there can be this mentality that like, I am not worthy. And there's a lot of like, like there, like literally songs are sung. Like I am not worthy to like be in the presence of God. And because God is so great and Jesus and and the whole thing. So there is, in my opinion now as an adult that goes back and reads both the old and the new Testament that I see it more 
through my own lens, which is very empowering um, versus how it was spoon fed to me as a child that I had to unpack and, and reprogram for myself. Got it. Yeah. I think that that just this, the text alone without any context or, you know, any other things that people put on it is such a beautiful reminder that we were created in the image of something very, very beautiful, divine, magical, and to not express that through loving ourselves and through putting our lives first and through advocating for our lives and taking radical responsibility over is, would be a shame. Yes, yes. Well, what a beautiful, glorious note to end on that everyone here is meant to thrive and love themselves and put themselves in the, the, the game of life in such a big and beautiful way. Please get your hands on a copy of Scout's book. It's just, it feels good to hold. It's a gorgeous book. It'll be beautiful on your coffee table. It'll be beautiful as the words land in your heart. Um, Scout, where can everyone go to get your book? You can go on Amazon just by searching The Emotional Entrepreneur or Scout Sobel, or you can follow me on Instagram at Scout Sobel. The link to purchase is in my bio. Excellent. And we will put the links in the show notes as well. Scout, anything else you want to say or share with our audience before we close for today? Just that you really are safe in your human emotional experience. And that in that human emotional experience, if you're willing to get under the lid, take a look and really, really sit with it It comes incredible, incredible gifts. Beautiful. And with that, we are going to close it out because there is nothing more to say that's going to be more high energy, more high powered or more needed to be heard today. Scout, thank you so much for all of the work that you did on yourself to get to this place where you could just be such a bright light and such a generous soul. Um, I know that this did not come easily, but it has come in a very strong way. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you, Gina. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, my love. Well, until next time, Scout and all of you in the Divine Living community, sending you big, big love and until next time for you as well. Bye. Queen. All right, woman, ask and it is given. That is right. I had so much fun and such big transformations occurred at the Divine Direction New York City event. I have opened up kind of a world tour for more locations coming to a city near you. That's right. We are going to be in Italy. Oh my gosh, at the most glorious location in October. We're going to be in Chicago in November, and we are going to be in South Florida in December. So check out divineliving.com forward slash direction, or the link is in the show notes and a whole white party soiree is how it kick off the Friday night or whatever the first night is. And then the next two days of solid training, coaching, transformation, being in the room with high vibe women from around the world in these elite kind of mini experiences. Uh, I mean, it's a big experience, but it's a mini event. I am so, so, so excited to welcome you there. So check it out. There's only 50 spots per event available. Uh, So if you want to meet me in Italy or Chicago or South Florida, the options are now open and you are in the early bird special pricing time. So snag your seat, get it reserved, and I can't wait to see you in real life.